I'm very pleased to introduce Fumiko uh, Suneishi. Uh, Fumiko is an archivist uh, and a film critic. After studying law and interdisciplinary cultural studies at Tokyo University in 1999, she started her career as film archivist at National Film Center, the National Museum of Modern Art Tokyo. In 2002, she took up the first digital film restoration projects of Japan in collaboration with European Film Laboratories. Since 2014, she is working as the head of the Film Archive Austria's technical department. The department is responsible for digitization, digital restoration and digital archiving of European heritage films. Fumiko has published scholarly articles in journals specializing in digitization, preservation and restoration. Her latest restoration works include Variety, Variete, Decline Veronica and Die Stadt ohne Juden. Fumiko Suneishi. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, unfortunately, my colleague Nicholas Wostry cannot attend the this event, so I have to take over the, his presentation, so to say it's a bit of a tricky situation for me, uh, because Nicol uh, Nicholas never prepares slides nor text. <laughs> so my following suggest uh, under my complete uh, responsibility, just inspired by Nicholas. Nicholas be very short abstract. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm uh, first. I'm, I, thank, I thank you very much, Nancy, uh, Professor Nancy Ertogan, uh, for, for accepting me as a as a as a uh, as a not not. Uh, as a presenter and for being so flexible. Thank you very much. Um, so Austrian Film Archive takes it as one of the one of the most important missions to collect nitrate elements, especially from the silent period, uh, and let them survive as long as possible in our wooden made uh, nitrate world. I have already uh, spoken about this world quite often, so I just make it very short. Uh, so, uh, it is inspired by Japanese Japanese the technique technique to store precious things in wooden boxes. And when I was still in Japan, I found uh, so I got a uh, very I got the luck to 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 find a film from 1910, original negative and a print from that in a wooden box. It was saved into was kept in in a normal storing condition in a in a company of uh, toothbrushes and so on, <laughs> and it was in a tremendous condition. And uh, it, I can't guarantee that, but I I assume I assume that the that it was uh, the, the wooden box has made a great role for the for this wonderful uh, wonderful uh, 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 result. Um, and I, I explained that when I came to I moved to Vienna to my to my director Ernst Kininger and he has got an idea. He's a, he was inspired by the idea. That's the idea to uh, he wanted to build the nitrate vault in in, in a bio so in an environment friendly way and Austria is a country which has a lot of wood <laughs> so and the wooden, wooden structure is a, a very important part of Austrian architecture not to it, of course so it has been realized it, I was just explaining the idea the, the, the idea and he realized it. it it was really incredible for me and, and another thing and today uh, so, so we are very proud that our nitrate elements would would survive very long. We we assume that it that our nitrate elements can survive more one hundred another one hundred years even. Um, 
and, and uh, so we, we, are, we are really good, actively collecting nitrate elements. And as a national archive, of course, then our focus is more or less on, on, on all Austrian film heritage, but not restricted to it. Due to its historical and geographical standpoint, Austrian film archive holds quite a rich collection originating from neighboring countries, namely Hungary, Czech, Slova Slovakia, Serbia, Croatia, and, and, and Turkey as well. And today I'm going to show two footages of Istanbul from around 1920. They are actually Pate, Pate film, films, so it's, they are no Austrian productions. Uh, but the, the first the first footage uh, oh no no that's the first footage <laughs> the first footage has been almost for forty years forty years in the archive it is especially precious uh, for the beauty beauty beautiful stencil coloring uh, which depicts the vividness of the city of Istanbul even combined with tinting and toning it's a very gorgeous in from the sense of color colors. So I'm showing the film first. I I heard that in uh, here that the film has been already screened in some film festival and so on. The, this footage is relatively known for Turkish uh, audience maybe. Uh, so I tr should I try to translate the titles. Uh, Turkish, Turkish city, city, city picture. Uh, uh, so the highest, the highest uh, wish of the religious Mohammedans is uh, to be buried in this city. Cemetery uh, at the side over the Golden Fort Rifts. Uh, the streets uh, are formed by the monuments of noble families. The entrance to Aoik Mosque in this in this mosque will be in this mosque, the sword of Mohammed is stored. Sacred pigeon in the uh, at the court of the mosque. <coughs> which enjoy the religious protection are nourished by pious believers picture by pious believers <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
pictures from Bosporus. Stencil coloring anymore, it's a toning, it's also beautiful copper toning. of Dolma Pakche is totally built of white marble and in, in 1875 the residence of Sultan Abdul Nassis. picturesque mosque of Alta Kree. was the first film and just recently another another source for this film has been found from totally a different collection uh, the, the first film is already assumed assumed that it was made it was compiled from probably two two different films because that the style looks quite different at the beginning and at the latter part. Uh, and that ne the next one has has a uh, uh, this one is not, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, so I have erased that, that picture. Sorry. Uh, so then the story of the second second film is. Um, uh, it was a legacy, a legacy of a film collector who was in the real life a high school teacher in the province of Austria. His house has been left for 20 years after his death as it was with all his stuff and in 2010 somebody has taken over the house, obviously, and she, she called us immediately, suddenly. Uh, take away all this stinky stuff, otherwise it will be, they, they will be all destroyed immediately. And so it was really in a rescue at the last minute. Um, and then, uh, uh, very fortunately, we could react immediately, and we could take all of uh, take away all these things, including these things. So that was the reason why I put this this picture to to this wonderful story. Uh, so that also these things. Then if nitrate uh, nitrate materials are really composing, so it can go to this this state. But very fortunately, again, this film. And about the constant no about Constantinople had had got no decay at all. So I'm showing the second film. It is also clearly pate from the stenciling at the edge, and from the film stock it is also early 1920s, and the typography is also the same partly. This, this we have seen already, just this title and the, the first sequence we have seen already. The second one we haven't seen, they are all different. <coughs>
Unfortunately, there is no stencil colored sequences in this second source. A combination of tinting and toning. Extremely old streets and paths run across the sacred city, populated by various tribes and races. Apartment of noble Turkish people whose interior is furnished with great luxury are wooden, con uh, uh, wooden constructions which makes humble impressions towards outside. the streets with the big bank palaces. <laughs> Galata Bridge which runs over the Golden Home. View to the harbor. <laughs> the typical narrow rowboats of Constantinople, so called Kaiken.
It's for me a very special experience to see these films in, in Istanbul with this music. <laughs> So and it is meant for me a topic too of the survival of film, uh, a fortunate chain of good lucks. So it, it, it is in this case especially it was, it was the second film, it was really a big luck, a chain of good lucks. Um, I have to say so if somebody has has thrown away this stinky stuff before. We have got to know about it. It would have been lost, and there are a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of ifs. And it has worked to, the, to our fortunate and to have a fortune. And so, and it, and another luck is that it is in thirty-five millimeter film format, which has which can be uh, played immediately. Although it has and it has some uh, problems, of course, and torn parts and so on. But the format is still actively used, and we can you can play it without any problems. So this second second footage I have scanned some some days ago just for the sake of this event and just a bit restored just a bit and as, as, uh, mainly just stabilized and just a bit uh, color color has been corrected a bit uh, so it, 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 because of this very uh, long lasting format we could do we could uh, work on it without any problems any migration problems so there is no migration needed to to make this film available after after 80 years or this 60 years and so on um, and another good thing is that I, we have still these both of these film materials in the in the vault and in this in the original form of nitrate um, so we can we can uh, immediately start to compare the films and the film materials uh, regarding the the stenciling at the edge or the splices how the, the how the film stock is uh, when from from which year the stock it has been made if it's made and so on. I mean, I have a bit of impression that in the second film that some other footages are mixed in, uh, so that has. To to be still detected or if everything belongs to this Constantinople film or not and so on and you have, maybe we can start a reconstruction project with the first source uh, how to reconstruct these two footages I have at the moment no idea uh, but maybe we can eliminate the we can separate the pictures it doesn't it doesn't belong to Constantinople that must be uh, possible and another uh, another point is the color uh, as many of you must be aware silent films were originally very often colored it has been mentioned today as well uh, with various kinds of methods like tinting toning stenciling and hand coloring and the other there or the other com other combinations and the attitude of film arch film archives towards these applied colors learned from the silent period have changed historically. It was not always the same. It is only recently, so namely after 1990s, and that the significant part of ethic aesthetics of silent films have got enough recognition. It did happen not really that film archives have duplicated the colored nitrate elements on black and white stock and in, in best cases with a certain documentation in a text form about the color and the original nit element, nitrate elements have been destroyed. Um, so in this case in it, we have a good luck to have both colors and in original form that we can investigate it. 
and uh, and I, I, I want to I wanted to speak about these these kind uh, these four patterns of reproduction of applied colors. So with the film archives have st have started with the first option internegative to use color films color film stuck on negative and print, and afterwards on black and white negative and color print and so on. There was uh, so and. And then the most authentic and the very expensive way to produce a very, a very beautiful copies was uh, to use a real dye tinting on black and white print stock. These three methods have been available for film archives, and and I I, I have I could have a good collect experience experience uh, from all these options, and I was never really happy with any. Any, any of them, uh, there are a lot of a lot of points, uh, but, but I'm not going so deep to that. And then now we are doing the scan. It is a really very simple thing, scanning uh, it as close as possible to the original and to to, to and uh, grade a bit the color to, to give get a better balance. And uh, I'm very I'm so happy about the result <coughs> of the digital methods. So I'm a film archivist and I'm a big lover of and a fan of film material. Uh, but too in 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 in, in concern with the the colors from the silent period. I'm definitely convinced that the digital method is the best uh, without uh, without getting another impression of the color. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the picture which has been screened today was too pale. It is the original file is much much vivid, much more vivid. Uh, it was the, the matter of colors, and now I'm going to the the picture information, going to the point of picture information. So like, survival of grains I named. Um, so uh, since I started in 2003, my first digital restoration, uh, still in Japan. My main focus is always how to grasp the original information in, uh, and the transfer into digital form. That is always the, the main point and the restoration is that has only the secondary importance for me. And so, so it is a bit, a bit old slide, I'm very sorry, but to give you a very short, a very light impression of what I mean. So in this in this picture you can see, so it is a, a footage from 1911, it's a very hard Trust for the full picture, and it is actually not well filmed. <laughs> so on the, on the uh, in front it is too dark, and at the back and in the background it is too bright because the sun is directly coming in, and here is a shadow. It is not really well filmed, but I want to keep all the, the information in a digital form, and in the histogram you can see that. And at the left side, there, were, there is still something, but it is cut off. So the dark part, it, it goes on, the, the mountain goes on, that you can see it. It has cut up, cut out abruptly. And that, that is seen in the picture in the front of the people, and the backs of the people. There, there is totally black, black places uh, where you have no information at all, zero information. So I want to save, I want to secure this place in the shadow. And this is another another slide. Then you can see now in the people you can see more details. I think it might be it's not a very good picture, but I think you can see that uh, the more there are more details in front. And instead, you are losing the information in the in the background in the bright part highlights. And in the histogramy, it's also very, it's also quite seen that the, the highlight is going really at, at the end of the possibility of the of, of the digital technology. So that 
this box is the area the digital method can grasp as information as senseful information and so to to save both the shadows and the highlights i have to make home I have to get the best balance, and that is the the uh, the result. You can see in the, the in front at the, and the persons, uh, the details, enough details, and at the buildings in the background also enough details. That's what I I always aim uh, at by scanning. Of course, I can't do it all the time in the best way. <clears throat> uh, so that is what I meant as uh, survival of grain, <clears throat> survival grains. Um, my principle is to scan the original so that uh, so that I can feel well enough. Uh, even if uh, it was the last chance, that means even if the nitrate decays more and more, and that they, even if that there is no other, no second time anymore, I can I can feel that I have grasped all the information which has been uh, hand on, handed on to to us. That is my my aim. Uh, of course, we never threw uh, never. Uh, of course, we never throw away uh, our nitrate nitrates and uh, all the other safety materials. Uh, but film film material decays. I have to admit, unfortunately, uh, it is possible that our nitrate will survive another one hundred years. Of course, in a positive sense. But I have to admit that. There are cases of deterioration which we cannot stop. Once the deterioration starts, it is very difficult to stop. Um, so then, if the nitrate starts to decay, you are losing the inform picture information like this. The emulsion is melting. The emulsion is keeping the picture information as a as a silver sword, <clears throat> and if it has happened, you can't save the picture anymore at all. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and I want to show also another example. Uh, it has nothing to do with Istanbul anymore. It's uh, one of a very dramatic case of my recent works of our recent works. It is a very short fragment um, the Udin von Toledo. As you can see it clearly <laughs> the nitrate is melting. So it is actively melt being actively melting. So but we could scan the the melting wet nitrate in this case like this. And uh, if we try it once again in one year, uh, the decay is even more, and you, you will you are losing more information, even more information. Then, then I have to do something with the, the, the data. If 
I have no second chance anymore to scan this film material, I have to do something with the scans. I have managed this on this moment, at this moment. I'm of course aware that the digital digital medium is not a medium for <laughs> for preservation exactly, uh, but photogra but photographic preservation that means um, copying an original material onto film stock in a very tra traditional way is getting more and more difficult and expensive. In Vienna there is no film lab anymore and we are now trying to do something with, with Hungary, with Czech and so on, but it is really getting more and more difficult and more and more expensive. After recognizing that, uh, personally, for me personally also, after recognizing that a simple digital scan can transfer the original image much more authentic than analog preservation, it is all the more discouraging for me, unfortunately, to do the analog, uh, analog traditional preservation and on a photographic, photographic, in a photographic way. Uh, for, lo for, for long term archiving of digital data, there are, among others, actually just one pragmatic solution, namely LTO tapes, it is a magnetic tapes, uh, which requires relatively co quick migration in every two to five years, which has uh, st statistically considerable chance of data loss. It is, of, uh, and that. Uh, I try to consider a more concrete scenario. If an unknown element would appear in 10 years from the Stadt in the city without Jews, which we have just restored and released worldwide, it had, things happen very often with, with metropolis and uh, so after the finally the fi after the after finishing the restoration of the complete version, another is, source is appearing. That's a rule about film archives, and so it can happen very easily. And so then, what should I do? And actually, one night and we have two nitrous sources for this film, the, the, the city without Jews. And the one is actually really actively uh, deteriorating, really, uh, partly. Then it is really probable that in 10 years I can't scan the far, the, this uh, nitrate source anymore. And then the, what would, we, would I do? The thing I definitely never do is to go to uh, our restoration. So, so we have restored the film, we have reconstructed the two, two sources and restored, cleaned the images and so on and so on. Uh, but I wouldn't like to use this for the next next re restoration because, um, of of course, we are very uh, as a as an archive we are trying to be very decent. We are trying uh, not to uh, not to cause any digital artifacts. So, so we are trying not to restore too much, not to go too further. But anyhow. Any digital restoration cleaning is an interference to the original material. Even if a very small scratch removing or dust removal, it is an interference because you can't erase the dust simply. You can just substitute the lacking part with uh, the information from a neighboring friends. That is definitely in the interference. The question is if you can see the trace of the restoration or not. But it, uh, this, this question doesn't interest me at all because I'm not looking the films in the, in the running in the running speed. I'm looking to the frames. And if you look to the frame, you see the trace definitely most of the times. And I can say that even absolutely always I can say that in a drastic way. So I don't want to go back for my next restoration to our restoration work. It's a contradiction, but it is like that. So I want to go back to the original original material. But if the nitrate is not anymore available, the second best solution would be maybe the scans from 2018, from this year, in 10 years, I mean. So, but 
if I would if I manage uh, uh, picking uh, picking up uh, bringing um, picking up the data scan data from the LTO tapes maybe uh, five generations lower than the current one uh, sorry as uh, so LTO tapes have a horrible structure you are getting every two years the next generation and you if you have the current version you can go just two generations back uh, to be able to read the information. So in 10 years, in 2028, I, I have uh, the LTO tape with the generation of 12 maybe. I have now seven. So I have to go back to from 12 to the seventh version. It's really a horrible uh, nightmare. And so to, be, to make, uh, in order to make it possible, I have to do migration in every five years or any shorter, even shorter. I have to uh, copy, migrate the data from the 7th to the 9th and to the 11th and to the 13th. That is, that is the migration. And to, to, to enable it, in order to enable this migration, you need a, you need a computer uh, of an older, old, old generation uh, which is matching the older gen old generation of the LTO and, and so on and so on. It is not that easy to get to keep the old uh, hardware alive. Uh, so it is a really uh, nightmare, but it is act unfortunately actually the, on the only solution at the moment in the for the concerning the digital uh, long time ar archiving. There is another solution uh, which is uh, which has been uh, produced uh, developed in Japan, uh, on namely on uh, optical discs like CD, DVDs, and so on, and it, that is for the storage purpose. Process, there is another option, but it is a very minor, and it is like VHS and the beta cassettes. You have to be on the majority side, otherwise it won't be updated, and you 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 can't go on with the minor minor format. Very unfortunately. <coughs> Um, so that would be uh, so. Uh, so this this is the story with the LTO tapes of, of concerning uh, the data data migration data and uh, storage. Um, and and another thing would be, uh, of course, the to. I can do also another thing to keep the scans uh, on, uh, in a form of 35 millimeter film. That is uh, what, for example, France is doing systematically. Uh, so for natural, uh, so uh, digital bone films, uh, for example, you have no other solution uh, than keeping the data in 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 some uh, in some format in some container because the, 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 it is there is no original film at all anymore. Then for that re for that purpose, you can uh, either you can take either LTO tapes or film stock that's that uh, the, these are two options so on the, you can go record the, the original data onto 35 film stock and keep uh, on, on polyester basis and you uh, probably you can keep the uh, film stock uh, for another 100 years but it is of course a um, uh, financial financial subject which we and we can never really afford. <clears throat> um, seemingly I'm the only one or one of the very few speakers coming purely from, uh, from film archives. I try to respond to the fascinating present presentation which I've enjoyed since yesterday's. Yes, since yesterday. In the archival world it is a very common commonly quoted saying that preserve to show, show to preserve, but many as you many of you are aware. In this in 
in this context to preserve doesn't mean only to collect the film or to 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 keep store the films in a, in a good condition but it and preserve it preserve to preserve means more actively to copy to make a copy of the original photographically photo, photochemically uh, onto a master master film material and create access copies that is the meaning of preserve to preserve make a copy and make another copy for as a viewing copy access copy the second part uh, show to preserve what this, uh, this saying stresses the fact that you can enlighten people um, for the significance of film archiving only by keeping on showing them the, showing them the results. That is a very important point. So you can you are these two things: the preservation and uh, screening or the making accessibility. These things look like. Uh, contradicting, but these uh, these things have been always connected to each other in a very interactive way. Uh, but this way of interactivity is now changing its form drastically, in my, in my opinion, because the access copies are nowadays mostly digital, and film copies are showing showing less and less. That means that it is a general tendency that film archives are getting dogmatic. Me too. So I don't want to lend, lend our film copies to, to, to outside anymore. I think it's quite often the case with the film archives nowadays. <clears throat> Uh, no unique copy will be rent to film festivals or the other archives. Instead, the copies are quickly scanned and provided as DCP or master file. And that is also preferred, very much preferred by many film festivals or archival cinemas even. It and so transport doesn't cost to transport a film. The uh, hard disk is much, of course much cheaper than than shipping a film copy, certified print copy. I'm all, I'm, and also the projection, the skills uh, projection is also um, being lost, uh, maybe slowly lost. Uh, it is getting a sort of art uh, to project film copies. Special art or special technique, and I'm also myself profiting this situation to bring here, for example, these two two beautiful footages, uh, freshly scanned for you, as actually. <laughs> So digital, so digital, digital material to show and film to preserve. That is uh, the current situation. But I, ha I thought that from the comment of, of, of Mr. Deutsch, Mr. Gustav Deutsch, I thought I was wondering if he has got uh, the or analog film materials, the film would have been different, maybe. Uh, so that is, as a pragmatically, it's a big advantage for film archives not to uh, leap the film, not to go 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 out of go the films out of not, not to let the films go out from the archives uh, but it is causing another um, problematics uh, but if the topic comes to so-called digital bond films uh, this balance doesn't work at all we are now brushing up the specifications what we should require as a digital copy for legal deposit purposes. So we, we are also responsible for legal deposits and, and in, in, in former days it was very easy for legal deposit purposes film producers had to bring us one 35 millimeter copy which hasn't been so much worn out. That is a description of an appropriate uh, legal copy and legal co uh, copy for legal deposit. But in a digital form, what should you bring? Okay, the, the most common commonly said uh, specification is a DCP uh, with a uh, encoded, uh, unencoded uh, DCP. 
it is a film format and it is a cinema format uh, but we wouldn't like to have just a DCP but we want to have a digital negative that is a original master material but some producers are bringing just Blu-rays or even this even DVD or USB stick uh, with a small file of MP, MP4 and so on. There, 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 there is a chaos at the moment. What should one take? Uh, should one consider as a digital copy, as an authentic digital copy? Um, so. So we are now brushing up the specifications, uh, but I'm wondering how this system or concept makes, how, how long uh, this system still, still makes sense. In the digital era, the border between film and other moving images is getting less and less visible. Amazon and Netflix are one of the biggest audiovisual content producers, film productions or audiovisual content producers. And Cohen Brothers released their latest film, not in cinemas, but as streaming. That, that shocked me quite a lot, I have to say. <laughs> with the two so with the two knight, with the two knighted elements about Istanbul, there is absolutely no question for me. Uh, both both knighted elements should be kept for eternity as long as possible. Um, but in digital era, an artistic selection or a curatorship is in, indispensable because it is simply not possible to keep everything, including all the iPhone videos. And so, to separate, in order to separate films worth preserving from the others, there is so there is a definitely a creatorship needed. So selection is needed, but it is something um, I, as an archivist, definitely wouldn't like to take over. <laughs> it is, I think, it is a quite a common feeling of archivists. Uh, so it is a completely new dimension from archives. So that is it for at the moment my conclusion. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Fumiko. Uh, before questions and answers, uh, I think uh, I mean, we were supposed to have another screening, but I think we should uh, stop here. Uh, I was hoping to give everyone a free time to themselves today, but I'm sorry, uh, just so late. So I'm very sorry about that. Uh, we have to reset, reschedule it uh, for tomorrow. Uh, but uh, please be seated. So, so if you have any questions. One thing which interests me very much, uh, and it's just uh, from the beginning of your what you presented, um, what is your feeling uh, about the idea of um, restoring colour to the early films which were originally coloured? We have got no colour elements, but we know quite a lot about the kind of colouring that was applied. So I'm wondering what you think about trying to replicate, to um, do versions of early films in um, colour which would not be accurate, but would give um, a good impression of what the films originally looked like. Yeah. To, to fake the original colours. You could call it that. <laughs> <laughs> the original was faked. So I don't. I think I think that's a rather loaded way to put it. Uh, that, if I may say so, is a, a Trumpism. Mm -hmm. No, uh, it would be it would be a reproduction, or a, in, in just the way that Robert Paul made reproductions of scenes from the Boer War. You could call them fakes. Mm -hmm. But what he was trying to do was to produce the appearance 
of something which could not be filmed. And I think there's a parallel. If you produce coloured versions of some early films, you would be making it perfectly clear that these are not the same as the original because the originals have disappeared, but they are similar to the way that people would have seen them, which I think would actually be a, a total transformation of the way we see early film. I mean, I think we, we are so conditioned to seeing early film as black and white because it was stored that way, uh, that it would be uh, a transformation of the way we imagine these films. And, and actually, the way we look at them, we would see the world as the original audiences saw it on the screen in colour. Not accurate, it was never accurate, mm -hmm. but it would just be a different kind of inaccuracy. Indeed, it is just an incident that we have got the colour information from the original source just for this film, for example, for the first example, for the second one, not. Unfortunately, we can do this for the second film as well, maybe this in the colouring. Serge Pompea has done that, I think, from Lobster film. He has done an extensive colouring. He had created extensive colouring, I think. So I'm, I'm also wondering why I'm that disturbed by the colourings of this world, first World War film. <laughs> and I'm so fascinated by this extensive colouring. <laughs> it quite, looks quite quite similar, I have to say. Uh, but, but of course, I'm a dogma, I'm dogmatic art archivist that as long as there is a there is a source, and there is a source, or so there is information in the source. I'm very happy, and I'm very, 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 very careful in that sense. But maybe it, it would be a different topic. But when in the, during the restoration of the city without Jews, I analyzed the, the, the way how the team, the, the colors were used. Maybe that for in the parliament and the sequences that is you know, tinted in, in yellow most of the time, but there are sequences which are not tinted or in the tinted print. Obviously, somebody has forgotten it, I think. And then, it, and then this sequence with the demonstration should be definitely in blue, it is toned in blue, but it isn't. It is tinted in yellow. It is totally ridiculous. I don't understand any, any, in any way why they did it. It's wrong. But, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not courageous enough to correct these errors because it is original. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, our, one of our sponsors has, uh, has complained that this color is not authentic. This, this vivid green color doesn't exist. But it exists. It was in the in the in the source, and so I took over the color. But but because but everybody thinks that I'm wrong. <laughs> but but I'm also not courageous enough to make it differently. And so but I'm also I'm very much attracted by the idea to make another version creative version as a Swedish, Swedish film archive has done that I have seen it in Bonn this year in, in August they have got just black and white sources but they tinted it very nice it looked so beautiful <laughs> so, but, so but it, why would they have black and, po oh, sorry. They have black and white positives uh, because I don't know about the um, specific film that you that you mean but it was not un uncommon that films were offered by a distributor or a producer in black and white or color. So in that sense, so in that sense, I, I think um, my, if I were in your position, mm -hmm. I would have kept them black and white. Me too, yes. but I am them for their courage, so to say. I think it's actually more courageous to stick to your guns rather than you know go by popular demand, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, following on from Ian's question, because I think to say we want to recreate the experience that the original audience might have had with a film, as was just pointed out by Nico, I mean obviously there were different versions around at the time, so I, I presume hand-colored was extremely rare, 
but there would have been maybe you know, tinted toned and black and white versions which were more common. But one thing that interests me is what you talked yesterday about when you pointed out that one can now digitally run uh, a, a film shot at 16 frames per second at 16 frames per second. Now, I've done, I've returned to my research on Buster Keaton recently and I came across uh, two things. First of all, I uh, found that the programs, they are very precise at a picture palace. They're very precise at what minute uh, an item on the program starts and what minute it ends. Mm -hmm. Except for the last item, because for the last item you don't know how long they take to get the audience out and next audience in. But it was very clear that uh, the general, arguably the best silent film ever made, in my view anyway, uh, uh, was shown at a much higher speed than what it was shot at. And then I actually found uh, a book by Daniel Mays, I reread it, uh, who in the 70s found a cue sheet for the general, uh, and it made it very clear that the film was shown very fast. Mm -hmm. So by Ian's logic, we should show, you know, when we do a big presentation of uh, a silent movie with a live orchestra, we should run it like mad, very, very fast. <laughs> what do you think about that? Uh, yes, it is also a very, very important topic for me, as I think it was, uh, there were three stages, so in the, in the very former, former period, and then the uh, film archives were screening the film, the siren films, always 24 frames per second, and it is not correct, we, we, we started to say that it has to be authentic, it, was, it should be 16 and 18 and so on, and, but, but, but it is another, there is another argument, no? Not really. It was not the the, the real the, the natural movement was not the rule of the silent films. Yes, it is. The, the, it is. We are in the third stage, so to say. I think. So we have to reconsider that the natural movement of the the the, the objects in the picture are really not the, not not really relevant. Yes, and uh, we are also quite uh, in, in that sense quite drastic to to. In, in, in terms of uh, fixing the speed of silent films. Uh, oh, we are making it more... Uh, I think it works. It works. Yes, uh, we are also... I am with you that it, has, it should be faster than the, the natural movement. Uh, but with Buster Keaton and so on, uh, with, with Ameri American comedy films, it is all the more, of course. And with the serious films, less and so on. Yes, there are a lot of uh, sources to indicate that it was the screening speed was even more than 24 sometimes. As it is for me astonishing, but it is it was not so rare uh, to screen high faster than 24 and in this case i made 18 uh, made it 18 frames per second version for this screening uh, so what you have seen on this screen was a third of the pictures were doubled frames <laughs> Indeed, so in a digital form, because it is stretched to fit the form, digital format with 24 frames per second as a container.